I love that uh, hymn that we just sang together this morning, and uh, the author of that hymn, Fanny Crosby, is one of, one of my favorite hymn authors. I, I, love, I love her hymns and the words of her hymns, and I, I think about that line in the hymn, Jesus doeth all things well. Jesus doeth, or does, we would say it in today's, today's vernacular, does all things well. I, I don't think it was always easy for Fanny Crosby to, to say that. Uh, Fanny Crosby, as many of you know, when she was six weeks old, was blinded by a doctor's accident. A mistake that a doctor made caused her to live her whole life. I believe she lived to the age of 95. Don't quote me on that, but somewhere in that vicinity. For 95 years on this earth, she lived without the blessing and the privilege of seeing. And so I'm sure it was hard some days, but she said this, and I find it amazing. She says, I have always believed, she said, that the good Lord in His infinite mercy by, the, by this means consecrated me to the work that I'm still permitted to do. I want you to think about it. She says, I've always believed, and I'm sure that belief wasn't always easy, but, but she always believed that it was by this means, her blindness, that... that and it was something that happened to her that shouldn't have happened to her. It was a mistake. It was something that shouldn't have happened. But she says, it was actually this means that consecrated me to the work that I'm still permitted to do. What, what enabled her? What enabled Fanny Crosby to have that kind of perspective? What enabled her to see her circumstances in that light? You know, it's amazing how different people can look at the same circumstance the same situation, and come away with a completely different conclusion on what happened or why it happened or how they feel or perceive that thing. Why why do you think that? What what is that? I'm looking for a word. What is the difference between two people looking at the same situation but seeing it completely different? What would be the word that we would use? Begins with a P. Perspective. All right, perspective. Did you guys... Did you guys get some assistance from my wife? No. Maybe, possibly. All right. Perspective. All right. Sometimes it's the most obvious answer that you're looking for. Perspective means this. It's a particular attitude toward a way of regarding something, a point of view. So our perspective, it's our point of view. And perspective determines in a lot of ways how we see and experience life. And we all have a perspective, and there's a lot of things that impact your perspective on life. What are some, I just want you, what are some of the things that you think affect your perspective on life? Just tell me some of those things. What are they? Somebody. What? Money. Money, all right. How much money you have could definitely change your perspective, sure. Your worldview? Yes. What people do to you, what, the things that have happened to you, absolutely. The experiences that you've been through absolutely shape your perspective. Anything else? Friends? Friends? Of course. So I, I listed some things. Things that, uh, things that impact our perspective are our gender, right? If you are male or female, you tend to see things sometimes in very different ways. A guy and a girl can look at a situation and they'll see it completely different. Our childhood experiences, our environments that we grew up in, our friends, our life experiences, where we were born, right? Can, you know, if you were born in the greatest state in the country, in New Jersey, right? You have a certain perspective. <clears throat> All right. Maybe not. You see, that was shaped by my what? My perspective, where I was born. All these things and more shape our perspective, but I want to suggest to you that if we are followers of Christ, if we, are, if we are children of God, if we've been born again, if we've come to Jesus in faith, and we've experienced the new life, the new creation that we've been talking about as our theme, right? If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, the old is gone, the new is coming. If that's true of you, then that reality, the gospel, should shape our perspective. And so as we're in Philippians this morning, I want us to think about the subject of Perspective. Paul, as he's writing to the church, is writing from jail. He's writing from prison, and he's going to talk a little bit about that in chapter 1. And Paul prayed for the church that, that they would overflow in God's love and His truth, that they would be transformed by Christ, and he wanted them to be courageous in their faith. And I want to suggest to you this morning that a courageous faith 
requires a gospel-centered perspective. That, that if we're going to live out this courageous faith that God calls us to, that we have to have a perspective on how we see life and how we see the things that happen and happen to us through a gospel-centered perspective. And so I want us to, to think about that because when we came to know Christ, everything changed, right? We went from being an enemy of God to a friend of God, right? You know, Jesus said that you now are my friends. That's a pretty extraordinary thought. We went from being lost to being found. We went being from separated to being a son or a daughter. We went from being dead to alive, saint, uh, from a sinner to a saint, from a slave to a child, right? Everything changed when we came to know Christ, and we need a perspective then that is shaped by that reality. And the gospel is, is something that we don't ever grow out of needing to know and understand in life. It's not just about being a ticket into heaven. It's not just about that. It's about a whole way of living and seeing life. And we need a perspective in life that's rooted and shaped in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Philippians chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 12 this morning as we think about how does, how does perspective impact my life and why it matters. So let's begin with verse 12. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So let's just stop there and, and to think about what he's saying. He says, I want you to know, I want you to get something, I want you to understand this. Right? As he writes to these, these, these saints that he loves very much, he says, I want you to know something. He says, I want you to know that what happened to me, right, he's in prison. Right? And he's in prison for no other reason than he has been faithful to God's call on his life. Right? He's been obedient to the call of God to go and proclaim the gospel, to lead people to Christ, to disciple them, to plant churches. And for that reason, he's been imprisoned in Rome. And he says, I want you to know that what happened to me, which was not a good thing, it was not an easy thing, in fact, it was a very difficult thing, but he says, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And so I, I want you to see Paul's perspective. It's an amazing perspective that he looked at his circumstances. He looked at his life situation that wasn't good. But he says, actually, what happened to me, the thing that happened to me, God is using it to accomplish his purposes. Look at verse 13. He says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And so I want you to notice that, that Paul didn't just look at himself and he didn't just look at his situation and think, man, this is so terrible. I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be here. I'm in chains. It's horrible. The food is horrible. The conditions are horrible. The rats are horrible. Right? Are you with me? Right? He, he could have been and could have had a perspective where everything was terrible and it shouldn't have happened and it wasn't fair and it wasn't right. But instead he says, no, it, what happened to me wasn't good. But because of that, he says, the whole palace guard, Roman soldiers, they're hearing the gospel. They're hearing the good news that Jesus died for them and that they too can experience and know the giver of life and they can know Jesus and they can experience eternal life. And he says, not only that, but everyone knows that I'm here because of Christ and for Christ. That I'm here because of, of Jesus. And he says, because of that, brothers and sisters, fellow followers of Jesus are more what? Confident, right? We talked about confidence yesterday. Paul wanted his brothers and sisters in Christ to be confident, right? And his confidence helped shape his perspective. And all of that was rooted in the gospel, right? All of that was rooted in his knowledge that Jesus had given his life for him and that he had redeemed him and purchased him and bought him and that his life belonged to God. His life was not his own anymore. And in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul said, I've been what? Crucified with Christ. I no longer live, right? It's not my life anymore. Yet, yet I, I do live, but it, Christ lives in me and the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so Paul had this incredible, incredible perspective and God was at work. And you know, like I said, it would have been really easy for him to say, it's not fair. How many of you have ever told your parents that? All right. Anybody not ever told their parents that? All right. All right. A couple of you. Wow, that's amazing. 
But a lot of us, or maybe it wasn't your parents, but a lot of us have been in a situation and we just said, this isn't fair. And, and sometimes it has to do with our parents, sometimes it's friends, or maybe even you felt that way towards God, right? God, this isn't fair. It's not fair that I have to go through this. It's not fair that I don't get to do this. It's not fair. God, why would you do this? Why would you allow this? Right? And those are all things that we wrestle with, and that's okay. It's okay to have questions. God's okay with your questions. Sometimes we get to the point, though, where we get to where if God was good, if God was good, He would not have allowed this. If God was good, He would have done this. And without realizing it, we put ourselves in a place of actually judging God. But I want you to know, it's okay that if you've been there, it's normal to be there. I've been there. We've all walked through that. But I want you to see that something had happened to Paul where he wasn't looking at a situation and saying it's not fair. And God, if you were good, if you were who you claim to be, you wouldn't have let me end up in prison. You could have, you could have kept me out of prison. Right? God could have. Right? We, we know God could do anything. His power is absolutely and utterly unlimited. So God could have kept Paul out of prison, but he didn't. God allowed him to walk through a painful and difficult circumstance, and God had a purpose in it. And Paul, because he was looking at a situation not just through earthly eyes and not just through his own, own perspective, but he was looking at it through the lenses of the gospel, he was able to see life differently. We never get over our need for the gospel, right? We never need to get over our need to remember that what Jesus has done, who we would be apart from him, and who we are because of him, and to see all of life through that perspective. So let's look at verse 15. Paul continues to, to share about these thoughts. He says, It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. So not only is Paul in prison, but he's saying there are believers, some that are preaching Jesus genuinely out of love because they want people to have what they have, right? You know, when you, when you, when you experience something really amazing, what do you want to do? Help me out here. You want to do what? You want to tell somebody about it. You're like, wow, man, have you ever eaten at this restaurant? That's so amazing. You've got to have that. You've got to try that. You've got to experience this, right? And when we experience the gospel, right, we should naturally want others to know, I found something so amazing. I found a God who loves me and who gave a son for me. He set me free. He's forgiven me. He's adopted me. I'm his child. I am beloved by him. And I want everyone else to know that. And so there were some that were preaching the gospel that way, but there were some, Paul alludes to, that were preaching Christ more to get a following, more to get followers, and, and they were actually doing it in rivalry against Paul, right? And so, but look at his perspective. He says, that's happening, right? They're trying to stir up trouble for me. They're trying to make my life more difficult, more painful. Have you ever had somebody that seemed like all they want to do was make your life more difficult, right? All right, everybody's experienced that. And so look at what, Look at, look at Paul's response, because I would have been irritated if that was happening. Anybody else with me? But look at Paul. Look at what he says. He says in verse 18, he says, what does it matter? What difference does it make? Why? He says, the important thing is that in every way, whether their motives are false or true, Christ is being preached. Now, when we get to false teaching, Paul's going to have a different perspective. But he says, These aren't, they're not preaching a false gospel. They're just doing it out of bad motives. And that, that does matter. Our motives matter. But Paul said, I rejoice the gospel is being preached. How could he, how could he say that? Why? Because his perspective was saturated by the gospel. He just wanted people to know about Jesus. And so he says, it doesn't matter if they're trying to hurt me. It doesn't matter what they're trying to do to me. Right? Life isn't about me. His perspective had been saturated by the gospel so that he saw his circumstances differently than he did before. And so... Look at verse, the second half of, uh, or look at verse 18, second half of verse 18. He says, because of this I rejoice. He says, I, I choose joy, right? I choose to rejoice. He says, I will continue to rejoice. You know, joy is a gift that God gives, but it's also a choice that we have to make. God's, God's gift of joy is available to us, but it's a choice whether or not we are going to participate in it. He says, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. So notice again his perspective, right? I want you to see perspective. He says, I choose joy, right, because of who God is, because of the gospel. And he says, I'm going to continue to rejoice, 
why I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Right? Paul had a confidence that, that his current situation was not his final situation. Right? The circumstances that he were in, although they were not good and they were difficult and they were painful, they were not the last chapter in Paul's story. And I want you to know that, that your circumstances, and all of us have different circumstances in life, and some of you may be walking through some painful things, some dark things, some hard things, some difficult things. And I want you to, to know that that chapter is painful and it's difficult, but it is not the final chapter in your story if you're in Christ. It's not the end of the story. That's not how the story is going. This story is not going to end there. And he, I want you to have the same perspective. He says, I believe that through your prayers and through the provision of the Spirit of Christ that what happened to me is going to turn out for my deliverance. And I think Paul had two things in mind. I think he really did think he was going to get out of prison. I really think he believed that and he did. Paul was released from this imprisonment, but I don't think that was all that he was thinking about. I don't think he was just thinking about getting out of jail because he was going to end up back in jail again later and eventually executed for his faith. I think he was also remembering the promises that this, in Christ, this life is not all that we have. We have eternal life in Christ, right? That, that actually in, 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 in the scope of things, our time here is just so brief, right? The Bible says our life is like a vapor. It's like the morning mist. It's here and then it's gone. And that could be a depressing thing if we didn't know Jesus, right? But because we know Jesus, we have been promised eternal life, life with God forever in His kingdom, new heavens and new earth one day. And Paul had a perspective because of that. Look, look at what he said in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing the glory that will be revealed in us. See, Paul had a perspective that the gospel had changed everything. It had changed his present, but it had changed his future. And so Paul could say, I can, I can, handle, and we're gonna, I can handle what I'm going through because of what I know, the perspective that I have. And so look at verse 20. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You see, Paul wasn't concerned about failing. He wasn't worried about that. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that, that I'm not ever going to be ashamed of my Savior or my faith, but he says, I believe I will have sufficient courage. Right? And that's what Paul had and he wants, would want you to have. He wanted the believers in Philippi to have sufficient courage to be faithful. And that courage comes when our perspective is shaped and saturated by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God loved me. That he gave his son for me. Jesus died for me. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father. And he's coming back one day in power and in glory to rule and to reign for all of eternity. And so he says, Christ will be exalted in my life, in my body. And he says, I don't know whether it'll be in my life or by death. But he says, here's the thing. He says, Here, here's the summary of my perspective. For me to live as Christ, my life is not about me anymore. It's about Jesus. For me to live as Jesus. For me to live is his glory, his kingdom, his purposes. Not my comfort, not my preferences, not my conveniences, not what I want, but what he wants. And he says, so for me to live as Christ and to die, well, that's gain. Right, because I'm going to be with him in his presence forever. Can you imagine trying to intimidate Paul? Right? Hey, Paul, we're going to kill you. Wonderful. To live is Christ, but to die is gain, so go ahead. All right, never, never mind, Paul, we're going to let you live. Wonderful. Then I'm going to serve Christ and live for him. No, 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 Paul, you don't understand. We're going to let you live, but we're going to torture you. Okay. But I want you to remember that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to me. So go ahead, have at it. Right? You just couldn't intimidate the guy. And why? Because his perspective was saturated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He treasured Christ above all. Your perspective in life is shaped by many things. Right? Many things have shaped your perspective. Where you were born the home you've been raised in or being raised in, the friends that you have, the views that you have, right? Your gender, all those things factor into shaping the perspective that we have on life. But I want all of us, if we are in Christ, if we're followers of Jesus, I, I want you to develop a gospel-centered perspective because you need that. 
right? Because in order to understand and make sense of and, and, and to walk through the things that we walk through in life, we need to be able to see those things through the lenses of the gospel. And that perspective, right, that perspective will help you to develop, like we said earlier, that undeterred trust in God. That's our goal for the week is to develop an undeterred trust, right, per- persevering despite the setbacks, and despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. And so I want you to have that perspective that's rooted in the gospel. Because listen, that thing you're going through, that painful thing, that difficult thing, that trial, and some of you are dealing with a lot of pain physically, emotionally, spiritually, I want you to know that that God is at work in that thing. That He has not forgotten you, He has not abandoned you, He has not overlooked you. He is with you. He cares about your suffering. He cares about your pain. The Bible says He enters our suffering with us. But I also want you to know that He is at work doing things beyond what you could know or imagine or understand. And He wants you to, in faith, right? It takes faith, courageous faith, to see those things through the lenses of the gospel. Paul said in verse 12, he says, I want you to know, I want you to know, and I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And so I just want to ask you, what's your perspective? What's what's your perspective? And what is your perspective being shaped by? And then even thinking about that last verse, verse 21, where Paul says to live as Christ and to die as gain. If you had to make a statement about what you were living for, how would you be able to answer that? Right? You know, what would be your, you know, to live is what for you? You know, is to live for yourself? Is to live for comfort? Is to live for success? Is to live for music? Is to live for your education goals? Is to live for you know, things that you want to achieve in life? All those things, if we're followers of Christ, are, 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 are fine and good, but they're not to be the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is to be Christ. To live is Christ and to die is gain. If you're looking for meaning, if you're looking for purpose, if you're looking for f- fulfillment, outside of Jesus, you will always, always be disappointed. Jesus does all things well. We can only understand that, believe that, and experience that through the perspective of a courageous faith that's shaped and saturated with the gospel of Christ. Fanny Crosby, who wrote that hymn, experienced great difficulty in life, not just being blind, but her circumstances were often not easy. And there was a time in her life where she was financially in great need, and she did not know where her provision was going to come from. And so she prayed, and she needed five dollars. Now we might think, five bucks, that's not a whole lot, but in her, in her day, that was a lot of money. And she didn't have it. And so she prayed, and she prayed for God to meet her need, and literally that, that day, someone knocked on her door and gave her five dollars, right? And she said this about that experience. She said that she was amazed at the Lord's marvelous answer to her simple prayer. She says, I have no way of accounting for this, except to believe that God, in answer to my prayer, put it in the heart of this good man to bring me the money. And she said, my first thought was, it's so wonderful the way the Lord leads me. And it was that circumstance of needing a financial, uh, having a financial need and praying about it that led her to write the words that we sang earlier this morning. It was out of that experience that she said, all the way my Savior leads me. What can I ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith, in him to dwell. For I know whatever happens to me, whatever befalls me, Jesus does all things well. She said that Jesus gave her grace for every trial, that he fed her with living bread. And then she looked forward in that last verse to the perfect rest that God had promised. And I think she could only do that because her perspective was shaped by the gospel and who Jesus was. And so it's my desire for all of you, for each and every one of you, to have a perspective on life that's shaped and saturated by the gospel. And so that you too, and I too, and listen, it's a struggle, it's not easy, but that we all together could say, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Can I pray for you this morning?